Hello everyone, my name is Wesley Livesey from the History of the Second World War podcast. My podcast is a mostly chronological retelling of the Second World War, starting not with the beginning of the war itself, but almost two decades earlier to try and determine why and how the nations of the world would find themselves in a worldwide conflict just 20 years after the devastation of the First World War. I hope you will join me on this journey through the most cataclysmic conflict in human history as we try and answer not just the questions of what and where, but why and how. Join me on a journey around the globe as we broaden the scope of Second World War history beyond the well-known battlefields of Europe and the Pacific. During weekly episodes, I seek to provide new insight for longtime students of the war, while also being a great jumping-on point for anyone seeking deeper understanding of World War II. You can find History of the Second World War on all major podcast platforms or at historyofthesecondworldwar.com. Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, Episode 21, The Next Generation. The Duke of Burgundy is dead. Long live the Duke of Burgundy. On the 1st of May, 1404, the body of Philip the Bold began a long procession from the Low Countries to the Charterhouse of Champmole, which Philip commissioned to be the resting place of the dukes of his dynasty. As the son of a king of France, the duke's heart was taken to the Abbey of Saint-Denis, while his entrails were buried near where he died in Hall. The rest of Philip the Bold's body was embalmed and traveled back, first to Flanders, and then to his final resting place in Dijon. Philip was buried wearing the simple habit of a Carthusian monk, but his funeral was far from humble. Over 3,000 feet of fine black cloth was purchased to make the mourning liveries of the duke's family, court, and hangers-on. Philip's coffin was pulled by six horses, caparisoned in the same black cloth. The coffin itself was covered with a cloth of gold pall and displayed the late duke's coats of arms, and was followed by 60 official mourners, all wearing black robes. Leading members of the Flemish nobility and members of Philip the Bold's court accompanied the coffin for much of the first leg of the journey, including John, the new Duke of Burgundy, and his younger brothers, Anthony and Philip. All told, the funeral procession included over a hundred people. Once back in Burgundy, Philip was interred in the Charterhouse of Champmole, in the magnificent tomb sculpted, and admittedly still being so, by Klaus Sluter and Klaus de Verve. The cost of Philip's funeral was immense. Much of his on-hand collection of gold and silver plate had to be melted down in order to pay for it, and that still didn't cover everything. Dino Rapondi, the favorite banker of the late duke, was called upon to help make up the rest, as well as to supply some fine Italian garments to the funeral procession. In total, the roll of parchment which kept track of all the expenses for the funeral was eight feet long. But now that the old Duke of Burgundy was in the ground, it was time for new men to take his place. John the Fearless immediately inherited the Duchy of Burgundy, and while his mother Margaret remained the Countess of Flanders, Artois, and Burgundy, the counties of Nevers and Rethel, which were already ruled by John and Anthony respectively, if only in name, would now be actually ruled by them in practice. I know the past few episodes have been very French court-centric, so this episode we're going to catch up with the Burgundian lands and look at what John and his allies were up to in the years after Philip the Bold's death. Next episode, we will return to Paris to see the conflict between the Orléans and Burgundian parties reach a new fever pitch. So before we go any further, let's get acquainted with our new Duke of Burgundy. So far, most of the attention we've paid to John the Fearless has been focused on his role in the Crusade of Nicopolis, and that really was John's first major experience doing much of anything. The other highlights of his early life include the 1385 double wedding at Cambrai, where Philip was the star of the show, and the 1388 expedition to Helders, where nothing that important happened. While technically the Count of Nevers, John took no role in the county's governance. Philip maintained control of all his territories and their revenues, and John didn't even have his own household. Rather, his remained a part of his mother's or father's. While the Nicopolis Crusade ultimately ended in disaster, it was John's first chance to prove himself, and he leapt at the opportunity. Not only did John lead the crusade itself, albeit accompanied and advised by a posse of much more experienced knights, but he helped his father in negotiations with the Flemish towns around raising funds for the crusade, 
John proved adept at dealing with the towns, and in the end was able to wring more money from them than what had been initially promised to his father. John learned his lesson from the defeat at Nicopolis, and going forward would not be so rash in military conflicts. In fact, despite his inglorious start in the military world, John would be arguably the best tactician of the Burgundians. And before all the Charles the Bold enthusiasts come at me, I did say arguably. After his return home in 1398, John was finally granted his own household, even if he still didn't control Nevers. In the years between John's return to France and the death of his father, the Count of Nevers split his time between shadowing his father in Paris, staying with his mother in Artois, and acting as a ducal representative in Dijon. The future duke did get some useful experience here. In Paris, he was able to learn about the power politics that dominated the royal council, and in Dijon, he presided over meetings of the ducal council. If there was a gap in his experience, it would have to be in his limited contact with Flanders in these years, something that the Flemings themselves were apprehensive of. But if John's youth was one spent in the shadow of his father, those of his brothers, Anthony and Philip, were even further in the dark. We don't know much about the activities of either brother during the life of their father. Admittedly, they were 19 and 14 upon his death respectively. Anthony was made Count of Rothel in 1402, but like with John and Nevers, he did not have any control over his county. Also in 1402, Anthony was married to Joan of Saint-Paul, a claimant to the Duchy of Luxembourg, right next door to Rothel. The younger Philip never received any territory during his father's lifetime. And as John the Fearless didn't have his own household until he was 27, I would wager that neither of the younger sons of Philip the Bold had independent households until after their father's death. But in 1404, Philip was dead, and it was time for his sons to come into their own. The years between 1402 and 1406 actually saw a number of momentous deaths. All of a sudden, so many of the men and women who dominated most of the narrative thus far were gone, and a new generation was taking over. 1402 saw the deaths of the Duke of Milan, John Galeazzo Visconti, and William, Duke of Helders and Eulich. Meanwhile, 1404 did not only see Philip the Bold's death, as his Bavarian counterpart, Count Albert of Haino, Holland, and Zealand, died later that year. Philip's wife, and the source of many of his territories, Margaret of Flanders, died a year later in 1405, and her aunt, Joan, the Duchess of Brabant, died in 1406. Philip had been in Brussels on the eve of his death, finishing the touches of a handover of Brabant to the house of Valois Burgundy. Philip never got his hands on Brabant, much to his dismay, I'm sure, but in 1403, he did finally manage to get the estates of Brabant to agree to pass the duchy to his second son, Anthony. This came at the cost of his repeated aid to Brabant in its military struggles, a promise to retain local rule of the duchy, the castlery of Antwerp, first seized by Count Louis of Mala in the 1350s, and the Duchy of Limburg and lands of Overmaas, purchased by Philip in the 1390s. The Duke of Burgundy was in Brabant, arranging for Joan to step down in favor of his wife, Margaret of Flanders, and in the end, his death did not stand in the way of that arrangement. Not long after the funeral of Philip the Bold, Joan transferred Brabant to Margaret, who in turn made Anthony the governor of the duchy. And so while Anthony would not technically become the Duke of Brabant until the death of Joan in 1406, from 1404 on he ruled the duchy and was granted the Duchy of Limburg outright in the meantime. Margaret ruled her counties, and really they had always been her counties rather than her husband's, in close collaboration with her sons until her death. And when Margaret of Flanders died in 1405, the last pieces of Philip's complex inheritance scheme fell into place. John became the Count of Flanders, Artois, and Burgundy Palatine, and in turn passed the County of Nevers to his youngest brother Philip, who also received Rothel from Anthony and the Champagne lands from Margaret. 1405 also saw the creation of an official alliance between John, Anthony, and William, the new Count of Haino, Holland, Zealand. While Philip the Bold and Albert of Bavaria had a good working relationship, their sons would be even closer partners. The double wedding at Cambrai in 1385 set the stage for a period of close collaboration between these three princes, who now ruled most of the Low Countries. Time and time again, when John faced political struggles in France, he would be backed up by his brother and brother-in-law. As the Duke of Burgundy and Count of Flanders, John was the leader of this alliance, but Anthony of Burgundy and William of Bavaria were no shrinking violets, 
and could be assured that this partnership would further their interests as well, both in the Low Countries and in France. The Duke of Burgundy did not control Brabant or haino holland zeeland outright, but this period does mark an increase in the Burgundianization of those territories. Administrators and officers reared in the Burgundian territories now began to make their way into the services of the Duke of Brabant and, to a lesser extent, the Count of haino holland zeeland Furthermore, while these territories were not held in a personal union by a prince, they did now form somewhat of a dynastic union. William of Bavaria may not have been a Burgundian, but he was about as close to one as you could get. And John would need the backing of his brothers and brother-in-law if he was going to face down Louis of Orléans and reassert the Burgundian position in Paris. With Philip the Bold gone, Louis of Orléans was now the unquestioned master of the royal court. While the two had been locked in a struggle which neither could win outright, Philip's death made the Orléanist position much, much stronger than the Burgundian one. Philip the Bold was the son, brother, and uncle to three successive French kings. He had spent decades at the center of French politics and could reasonably claim his spot there as a birthright. John the Fearless, on the other hand, was just one cousin of a king that had many. He had inherited his father's network of allies and clients, but he did not have the same inherent connection to court as a whole. But apart from the weakening of the Burgundian position at court, Philip's death marks the true emergence of the next generation taking control in Paris. As Jonathan Sumption wrote, quote, A younger generation of French royal princes, of which the 32-year-old Duke of Orléans was the figurehead, was coming to power. They had not lived through the catastrophes of the mid-14th century. They lacked Philip's cautious ways, his wider grasp of European politics, and his understanding of the limits of French power, and they did not share his historic respect for England. We saw the Duke of Orléans pushing for renewing war with England in the last episode, and while the next few years won't see the widespread conflict that defined the first stage of the Hundred Years' War, England and France were definitely no longer at peace. But the negotiators soon returned to Lollingham, and although the negotiations there over the next few years wouldn't be very successful, they would continue. Most of the conflict would be focused in Guienne, and so we won't be covering that in this episode. However, there was the occasional violence in the Low Countries. 1404 saw some raids by English forces and privateers on Flemish shipping, and a few expeditions to Flanders itself. The Flemings, in turn, captured a few Englishmen traveling through the county. But in 1405, Valorant of Luxembourg attempted to take Mark, an English outpost near Calais. This campaign, like all others done by the Count of Saint-Paul against the English in recent years, accomplished little more than to annoy the English. In the aftermath of this campaign, Henry IV sent a protest to John the Fearless, as, since he was now the Count of Flanders and Artois, Valorant was his vassal. However, the Count of Saint-Paul was also currently serving as the Captain General for Picardy, and so, in military matters, was taking orders from the Orléans-dominated Royal Council, rather than from John. In fact, Valera of Luxembourg had also recently accepted a fief rent from Louis of Orléans, and his actions and mark can be seen as an Orléanist attempt to harm the still ongoing Anglo-Flemish negotiations. The English responded to Valeron's raid by sending a force of their own to Slaus for a raid of their own. John the Fearless was able to summon the militias of the Franc or Free Quarter of Bruges and repel the English in an effective collaboration between Count and Member of Flanders. Although the English attack on Slaus was an overt violation of the earlier Anglo-Flemish Treaty of Neutrality, it did not mark a break in the negotiations between the English, the Members of Flanders, and the Count. Negotiations to extend and expand the agreement were ongoing in Calais, and would continue as the war continued to heat up. However, while John was content to remain in discussions with the English, he did not take the attack on his territories lightly. In response to the English response to Valera's siege of Mark, the new Duke of Burgundy sent secret embassies to both the Teutonic Order and to the Hanseatic League to see if either would be willing to carry out a joint attack on the English. Both embassies came to nothing, but it does go to show just how annoyed John was at the English. The next two years saw John launch the occasional attempt to take Calais, but none of them got far off the ground, for the most part due to the goings-on of the French court, which we'll explore next time. And it is a good thing that John remained mostly at peace with the English, because in 1407, a new Anglo-Flemish treaty was signed, which would ensure Flemish neutrality and protect the wool trade, 
even if France and England returned to a full-blown war. But like in the later years of Philip's life, this was an Anglo-Flemish treaty, so while Flemish neutrality was assured, John's was not. Like his father, in dealing with the English, John had to balance his role in Paris and his role in Flanders. If John was seen as too pro-English, his standing in Paris and his power in the royal council would suffer. Well, if he was seen as too anti-English, he risked another Flemish revolt. John threaded this needle well, and while I won't get into his public relations campaigns in the French capital in this episode, I will note that he was a fairly popular figure at the time. But now we have to see whether or not John was popular in Flanders. I mentioned before that in the years leading up to Philip the Bold's death, John had spent very little time in Flanders. During these years, the Duke of Burgundy had been a largely absent figure from the county too. So when John made his joyous entry into Ghent in 1405, the four members, being Ghent, Bruges, Ypres, and the Franc of Bruges, presented him with a list of demands. These demands could essentially be boiled down to a few main points. First, that John or his wife reside regularly in Flanders. Second, that John respects the traditional privileges of Flanders and moves the comital consul from Lille and Gallicant Flanders to a town in Flemish Flanders. Third, that John attempts to secure an Anglo-Flemish peace agreement. Fourth, that John fills his administration with Flemings and dismisses many of the Frenchmen. And fifth, that John corresponds with Flemish requests in Flemish. All of these demands, with the exception of the Anglo-Flemish Treaty, were responses to the centralization and Frenchification that occurred during Philip the Bold's 20 years as Count of Flanders. While John the Fearless would end up responding positively to all of these Flemish demands, he would continue the centralization of the Burgundian administration. More on that later. We've already seen that John continued negotiating with the English, and he ended up acquiring a firmer deal than his father had managed. And John was happy to accede to the Flemish demands for a Flemish government. You might think that the past few episodes have been too focused on events in France and didn't pay enough attention to Flanders, and well, the Flemish felt the same way. Richard Vaughn compares Philip's last four years with John's first four. He found that in those respective periods, Philip spent about a week total in Flanders, compared to about a year for John. Furthermore, while Margaret of Flanders spent almost all of her time in Arras, John's wife, Margaret of Bavaria, spent an additional two of those years in Flanders, where she took an active part in the government of the county. John and Margaret even followed in Philip the Bold's footsteps by participating in an archery competition in Audenarda in 1408 to help build the relationship between the ducal house and the towns. In fact, Margaret's participation is the only confirmed instance of a woman participating in a medieval shooting competition. John was perfectly willing to accommodate the demands of the four members with regards to the location and language of the Flemish administration as well. The Commodal Council was moved from Lille to Audenarda and then to Ghent, and although John continued to have the council deliberate in French behind closed doors, he did mandate that requests made to the council in Flemish be answered in Flemish. As for personnel, the new duke did begin to employ more Flemings in his government than his father had. However, this was more of a gradual transition than a shake-up. But not all of John's changes were so well received by the Flemings. As I just mentioned, the Duke of Burgundy also took the opportunity to increase the power of the Count in Flanders, and the increased comital presence would also be used to further that end. A few years into his reign, John would expand the powers of the comital council in Ghent, mostly at the cost of urban judicial privileges. The two main areas of this expansion were in urban-rural relations and lawsuits involving foreign merchants. Furthermore, the council was given the additional task of overseeing the meetings of the four members of Flanders, and while this task didn't include any direct control, it did mean that the duke now had his finger more on the pulse of the meetings. But John didn't limit his reforms to curtailing the power of the towns. He also made sure to increase comital oversight of his own officials. Responding to earlier complaints, some powers of his officers were limited, and he also increased the Commodal Council's competence to oversee and discipline those officers. In working to increase his power over the towns, John worked to co-opt the urban patriciate wherever possible and exploited all of the divisions in Flemish society. John was able to expand his power over the towns because the major towns were busy working to expand their power over the countryside and the smaller towns within their quarter. 
When a town resisted John's reforms, as Ghent did twice in 1406, or Bruges did in 1407, the Duke of Burgundy could take comfort in the fact that the rivalries between the towns would prevent a widespread Flemish revolt from breaking out. Furthermore, the Duke of Burgundy used those revolts as excuses to increase his own power over the recalcitrant towns. In the aftermath of Ghent's revolts, John wooed the magistrates of the town. This revolt was both against the count and the patrician magistrates, so once it was put down, the magistrates saw John as a natural ally. They were further enticed to the count's side by John's movement of the commodal council to Ghent the next year. However, after Bruges' revolt, John took a harder line. But this revolt, like those in Ghent, was not a serious threat and was put down without the use of significant force. Once put down, John added some supporters of his to the Bruges city council and even expelled some of the more unrepentant members of the Bruges council a few months later when they still proved uncooperative. Going even further, John implemented two widely hated measures on the town. The first of these was a one-seventh tax on all the income of the city, known as the seventh penny, and the second was a ban on the summoning of urban militias without the consent of the count. These measures both increased the count's income without having to rely on aids voted to him by the city, and limited the power of Bruges to threateningly demonstrate against him. The people of Bruges referred to these measures derisively as a kalfvel, or calfskin, in an attempt to play down the ordinance as just a piece of parchment. Finally, it was Ypres' turn to face down the count. There was an anti-Burgundian party within the city, which had been making more and more noise since 1404. This party gathered the citizens of Ypres in an illegal assembly and drew up a manifesto proclaiming the town's rights and privileges. But when John went to Ypres in the aftermath of putting Bruges in its place, no one wanted to bring the manifesto to the count, and the support for the anti-Burgundian party evaporated. And so, Ypres was cowed. John was aided in his cowing of the major urban centers of his realm by the fact that none of them worked together in their risings. And furthermore, there was always some pro-Burgundian faction within the cities willing to work with the Count of Flanders and to limit the power of the anti-Burgundian faction. Finally, the uprisings in 1406 and 1407 were against the local patriciate as much as they were against the Count. And so when these revolts were put down, the patriciate was far more likely to either treat with or submit to the Count than they were before. But John did not only deal with the urban patriciate of Flanders with the stick, he also had carrots to offer. Early in his reign, the Duke of Burgundy showed himself willing to accommodate the demands of his Flemish subjects, and time and time again, he showed himself willing to protect Flemish commerce and manufacturing. John's rule of Flanders also marks an increase in comital patronage of urban elites. He granted his clients favors and protection, and employed many more Flemings, especially patrician Flemings, in his administration and court than his father had. John also facilitated the union of patrician and noble families, especially those noble families already linked to the comital one. There was already some intermarriage between nobles and patricians, and there wasn't a firm line separating patrician from noble, but under John, the practice was further encouraged. This combined noble-patrician group would end up providing the Burgundians with many of their officers, courtiers, and advisors in the future. As Wim Blockmans and Walter Prevenier wrote in their book, The Promised Lands, quote, This ducal strategy was intended to limit the autonomous power of the great cities, but not to break the power of the elites within each city. Resistance to the Burgundian dynasty in Flanders was greatly reduced by the discreet mustering of support from the top layers of the city magistrates, and thus, indirectly, within the Flemish representative body of the members of Flanders, individual members of which were recruited from among the city aldermen. Influence within the four members was essential for the duke, because this representative body was the spearhead of resistance to centralist governmental policies and the struggle for autonomy. But John was not only the Count of Flanders, he was also the Duke of Burgundy, of course. And if we haven't paid enough attention to Flanders recently, we've definitely neglected the duchy which lends its name to our main dynasty. The new duke was far more experienced with the affairs of the duchy than he was with the county of Flanders when he first came to power, and so there was not the same initial demand for an increased ducal presence as John had served as his father's representative to the ducal council on occasion. John was sure to extend his policies of centralization to Burgundy as well, 
Like in Flanders, he worked to increase the Ducal Council's oversight of his officers, while simultaneously granting those officers more power to act on their own initiative. As the Duchy of Burgundy did not have urban centers of the same caliber as Flanders did, the Duke did not have to worry about limiting the power of the cities, and was thus able to focus more on reforms to the Duchy's financial apparatus. This is not to say that the Duke ignored the cities altogether. In fact, he wooed the patricians of Dijon in the same way he did the patricians of the great Flemish towns. John continued his father's program of building and maintaining defensive fortifications, whether town walls or castles. Although Burgundy was largely at peace, these projects both served to demonstrate his commitment to protecting his people and to secure the ducal position in a time of danger. And the two Burgundies were not entirely at peace. In the last few years of Philip the Bold's reign, the Duke had been working to increase his power in the county. There were two main centers of resistance to ducal rule, the Comtois nobility and the city and bishopric of Besançon, and both of these centers of resistance continued to cause headaches for John. Back in the 1390s, Philip had a showdown with Jean de Chalon, the Prince of Orange, and in 1401, he had another noble try to subvert ducal authority. Humbert de Villar tried to claim that his lands were alloidal, or that they were held without any feudal obligations to Philip. In response, the duke summoned de Villar to the Parlement of Dole, and in the end, his case was found lacking. Admittedly, the Dole Parlement was run by Philip's officers, so it's hard to say how objective the court was. The Parlement levied a fine against Humbert de Villar and ordered the confiscation of his territory of Montreal. The lord refused to submit and instead hold himself up in one of his castles. To enforce the decision of the Parlement, Philip's governor of the county summoned a small army to take de Villar's castle. Proving how successful Philip's earlier cowing was, Jean de Chalon took part in the siege. Montreal was absorbed into the ducal domain, and Philip further increased his control over the Comtois nobility. But that doesn't mean that the entirety of the nobility was cowed. In 1407, Louis de Chalon, a cousin of Jean de Chalon and Count of Tonnerre, which was a dependency right on the northwestern edge of the Duchy of Burgundy, abducted one of Duchess Margaret of Bavaria's ladies-in-waiting. This act, apart from being abhorrent in its own right, was a double offense to the Duke, as it was an insult towards John's wife and to the influential de la Tremoil family, of which Louis de Chalon's wife was a member. John summoned Louis de Chalon to account for himself on three occasions, and when the Count of Tonnerre did not appear, he was banished from John's territories, and all the lands that he held in the two Burgundies, of which there were many, were seized. Eventually, John and the Count of Tonnerre would officially reconcile with each other, and John would return some of Louis's lands, but a wedge had been driven between the two men, and this will not be the last time we hear of Louis de Chalon. And, as a quick aside, the word tonnerre means thunder in French, so John the Fearless had enemies in both Bayezid the Thunderbolt and the Count of Thunder. As I said earlier, the imperial city of Besançon was another thorn in the side of the Dukes of Burgundy. Or rather, the Dukes of Burgundy were a thorn in the side of Besançon. As both a free imperial city and a seat of an archbishopric, Besançon was independent from the Counts of Burgundy, despite being right in the center of the Franche Comte. However, the Valois Dukes of Burgundy were not about to pass up any opportunity to expand their influence. Philip the Bold had convinced the city to place itself under his protection in 1386, and furthermore, to pay him a small tribute for that protection, and allow a ducal officer to take up residence in the city. And over the next two decades, Philip worked to steadily further his influence over the city. Philip also worked on the cathedral chapter, and in 1393 was able to secure the appointment of one of his former counselors to the see, and sometimes acted as an arbitrator when the city of Besançon and the bishop of Besançon came into conflict. Even when there was pushback against Burgundian influence, such as when the city tried to expel his officers in 1400, Philip was able to reassert his power over the city and came out on top. And when he took over, John continued working to incorporate Besançon into the county of Burgundy. Upon becoming Count of Burgundy in 1405, John was made guardian of the city of Besançon, as Philip had been. So when the new Archbishop of Besançon fell out with the civic authorities in 1406, John saw an opportunity to expand his power over the city. After the Archbishop fled the city, the magistrates of Besançon made plans to exclude the Archbishop from the government of the city, 
The bishop responded by excommunicating the magistrates of the city and placing Besançon under interdict. And with the bishop out of the city, one of John's officers convinced the magistrates to offer up the bishop's share of government to the duke in exchange for him making Besançon the center of administration in the county of Burgundy. John was amenable to this arrangement, and soon preparations began for Besançon to become the seat of a parlement, a chambre de compte, a comital council, and all the other trappings of the ducal government in Dijon, which would have essentially removed the Franche Comte from the purview of Dijon. However, both the ducal officers in Dijon and the supporters of the archbishop pushed back on this. Eventually, the plans for an independent comital council seated in Besançon were shelved, and the duke came to an agreement with the archbishop where they would share power over the city. So while the Duke of Burgundy was expanding his power in his territories, he was facing adversity in Paris. In the last years of Philip the Bold's rule, royal gifts accounted for somewhere between a third and a half of the Duke of Burgundy's total revenue. But once he died and the Duke of Orléans began to dominate the royal council, those gifts dried up. And so, in order to maintain the Burgundian state's solvency and his family's position of prominence, John knew that a confrontation with Louis of Orléans was necessary. The Duke of Burgundy hadn't been ignoring Paris in the first years of his reign, and next episode, we'll see what he was up to in the capital, and how he worked to re-establish the Burgundian position against Louis of Orléans. Thank you to my patrons. Christine, Comte de Chenonceau. Elliot, Graf von Kravenstein. Anthony, Comte de chateauneuf nuxois James, Graf von Temse. And Preston, Comte de saint Fargo. And thank you to my Knights of the Duchy. If you want to join them, you can at patreon.com slash Burgundy. If you want to support the podcast in other ways, you can do so by leaving a review on your podcast app of choice and telling your friends about the show. Both really help to grow the show and will earn you my everlasting appreciation. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me at Valois Burgundy on Twitter or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website for maps, images, sources, and more at granddukesofthewest.com. Once again, thank you for listening.